A famous fractal that's going to turn out to be relevant to our, our thinking about um, chaotic systems, but for now is just our first example of a fractal is, um, is the Cantor set. And so let me define the Cantor set for you. We start with the interval 0, 1, and the Cantor set is going to be a subset of the points that live in this interval. So uh, to start creating the Cantor set, we take this interval and we split it in thirds, and we erase the middle third, and we're left with two line segments, the line segment from 0 to 1 third, and the line segment from 2 thirds to 1. This, this set is not the Cantor set, but the Cantor set is a subset of this new set that we've created. So we take this set, 0 to 1 third, and we split it in thirds, and we erase the middle third, and that leaves us with two intervals. But actually, we do the same thing with the set 2 thirds to 1. We split it in thirds, and we erase the middle third, and that leaves us with these two intervals. And so S2, our latest set, actually consists of four line segments. The Cantor set is a subset of this set, S2. And then I head to each little line segment, and I split it in three, and I erase the middle set, so we get two left. And I split this one in three and erase the middle, so we get two. Split this in three and erase the middle, we get two. Split this in three and erase the middle, we get two. And we're left with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're left with eight little line segments. And um, this is the set S3. The Cantor set is a subset of this set. To create S4, I zoom in on this line, I cut it in three and I erase the middle third. Zoom in on this one, cut it in three and erase the middle third. Zoom in on this one, cut it in three, erase the middle third, etc. I had eight lines and now I have 16 lines for S4. The Cantor set is a subset of S4. In fact, to get to the Cantor set, we need to continue this process indefinitely. And the limit, the limiting set of this process is the Cantor set, the set that we're interested in. As you can see, it's a set of, of dots on the real line with very large gaps uh, between regions where there are dots. This set, the Cantor set, which I, I'm going to call C, um, it has some important properties that are more generally properties of, of fractal objects. Um, the first important property uh, I want to mention is that the Cantor set C has structure at arbitrarily small scales. So you're probably used to the situation where when we zoom in to a geometric object, uh, let's say the sphere, this, it's a surface, it's a, it's a 2D object, and when we zoom in on it very, very tightly, we end up seeing something that looks like a plane, uh, a flat Euclidean structure. That's not happening with the Cantor set. When we zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, we basically still see structure. We're never seeing a, a line or a plane or, um, or a manifold of this type. Instead, we're always seeing an object that has structure and that if we continue to zoom in, we would keep seeing its structure. The Cantor set is a set that is self-similar. And by self-similar, we mean that if we look at the set, we can find another copy of the set by, um, by if we take the set, uh, let's imagine this is standing in for the set, and we zoom in on a piece of it, um, there's a nice mapping between that piece of it and the whole set. In fact, if we enlarge this piece of it, it's going to look identical to the entire set. And um, this is a simple fractal, and so there is this perfect self-similarity where we zoom in and it is identical to the whole set. Um, that perfect self-similarity doesn't necessarily exist in more general fractals, uh, but the idea is there that, that there are copies of the structure that, that we're used to, and those copies happen at a number of different scales. Uh, approximate copies happen at a number of different scales. A third property to note is that the Cantor set has non-integer dimension. I challenged you to imagine zooming in on it, and when we imagine zooming in on it, we're left with a bunch of dots. Uh, so we don't zoom in 
and find a straight line as we would if we were zooming in on a one dimensional curve, but we don't zoom in and find a single point as we would if we were zooming in on a, a point. And uh, so we are gonna need to find a way to define the dimension of, of the Cantor set, but, um, but it's going to be, it's, it's going to seem natural. It's the dimension, the dimension definition we choose is, is going to make sense. And it's going to be clear that the Cantor set shouldn't have an integer dimension. I want to argue that the Cantor set is uncountable. Uh, this is just something that's interesting about the Cantor set, not something that I'm presenting as a, as a property of fractals, but, uh, let's look at our set and, um, Let's just start creating an index to keep track of the numbers in our set. And I'm going to give it a zero if the number is going to be on this side of the set and a one if the number is on this side of the set. And when I split again, uh, I'm going to add a zero or a one label. So if an element of the set is, is with lies within this line segment, then it's going to start with zero, zero in some kind of representation of it. Uh, and if it lies in this line segment, we're going to start with zero, one. If it lies in this line segment, we'll start with one, zero. If it lies in this line segment, we'll start with one, one. And actually, let's just start imagining these as decimal expansions. So uh, a point over here would get start being represented I'm sorry, I don't mean decimal, I mean binary. It will start being represented 0, .00, 0, 0, and here it will be represented 0, dot, um, 0, 1, and these points are 0, dot, 1, 0 points, and these points are 0, dot, 1, 1 points. And as I go into S2, uh, zeros, ones, zeros, ones, zeros, ones, zeros, ones, Every time I go left, uh, I choose a zero. And every time I go right, I record a one. And so as I move down levels of S to begin to try to find a point that lives within the Cantor set, I'm accumulating a trail of zeros and ones describing my location. So if I'm down here, I started with zero, 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 and zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one etc. in this way. And so, as you can see, to get to a point in the Cantor set, I can traverse S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6, etc. Et and in every one of them, I live within some sub-interval that exists in that set as I, as I descend to my point. And so actually, uh, every point in the Cantor set can be represented by these expansions, by expansions of the form zero dot a zero or one, a zero or one, a zero or one, a zero or one, uh, uh, forever, because, um, because we never stop the process. And, and in fact, every single number with a binary representation, um, is here. If I give you a number, let's say I give you the number zero point zero one zero one zero one zero one etc uh you can find that in the cantor set we go to the zero and then we go to one and then we go to zero and then we would go to one and then we would go to zero and then we would go to one and then zero and then one and uh this is basically an instruction for finding a point that lives within the cantor set so you can give me any uh binary expansion of this type um and uh, so long as it doesn't end, I'll be able to find a corresponding point in the Cantor set. Why is this an uncountable set? Well, um, I'm going to try to make a list again. Let me make a list of all the different points in the Cantor set. And so uh, I used B because these numbers are from binary. And um, so my first, the first number I wrote in my list is zero dot some binary, 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 etc. And then I wrote a second number in the list and a third number in the list. And I tried to write down every single number in the Cantor set. Uh, and since I was able to write them in some order, I'm guessing they might be countable.
but I'm going to use a similar argument to the one we used before to show that I couldn't possibly have written every element of the set. So let's see. B11 is either a 0 or a 1. And if it's a 0, I'm going to write a 1. And if it's a 1, I'm going to write a 0. And so I've just made sure that as I construct a new number, it differs from B11 in that first digit. And then um, for the second number, uh, to diff I'm going to make sure that my number differs from the second number by giving it a different B22. So if there was a 0 in B22, I'm getting a 1. And if there was a 1 in B22, I'm getting a 0. And then, uh, of course, as you might have guessed by now, I'm going to head to to the third number, and I'm going to make it differ in the third digit. So if this is a 0, I'll put a 1. And if this is a 1, I'll put a 0. And I will continue this process. This is the same process that we used to show that the interval from 0 to 1 was uncountable. And I can, com I can continue this process for every single number in this list. Uh, the nth number is going to differ in the nth binary digit from the number that I'm constructing. And mm, so let's say this is a 1, then that's a 0. And um, this difference means that I'm in the midst of constructing a number that did not appear on this list. Uh, but this list was supposed to have all of the numbers in the Cantor set. However, I told you that we can find a point in the Cantor set for, for any set of zeros and ones, and I've just made one that's not on the list. So this definitely represents a point in the Cantor set that's not on this list. And that means that we just aren't able to make a list. Uh, and so for that reason, the set is, is uncountable.